Yeah, so uh, just a little bit about me. I'm a software de developer for Eloquentix. We are an IT consulting and uh, contracting company. We've been doing Scala for like five years now. Um, yeah, the Monix library, Alex's brainchild, which you might have heard of. Um, uh, it's a result of the work we've been doing in the field of renewable energy and uh, power plant monitoring. So if you like to know more about Monix, Please go talk to Alex. He likes to brag about performance and, and his child. Um, yeah, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm into FP as everyone here and programming languages and compilers. The last subject is the reason you're seeing this today. I, I also blog uh, mostly tech stuff at igstand.ro. And that's all about me. The plan for today is this one. We're going to do a little compilers overview for those that do not know them that well. Uh, for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to introduce a very little uh, language called MicroML. I chose Micro because everybody talks about microservices, so in MicroML, maybe it will have success. Um, next, I'm going to talk about an actual type inference algorithm using uh, in this particular language, MicroML which is composed of two parts. We're going to talk about the intuition today, and during the unconference, I can show you the code if you want to. Um, just a quick question out of curiosity. Is anyone here that thought, or th yeah, that th thought that ML comes from machine learning? No, okay, <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. So ML comes from meta language. It was a language used to script uh, a, a theorem prover in the Edinburgh University. Um, what did I do? Oh, okay, so compiler's overview. What's a compiler? A simple function, takes in some source language and produces some target language. Um, in our case, this is what our source language would look like. We have an anonymous function here with a, 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 a single parameter called A. We, we're just returning that, it's the ident identity function, and immediately after that, we just apply the function to the argument two. The result is two, right? Nothing complicated. What's the output? Some JavaScript because everybody loves it. <laughs> okay, next. What's inside the compiler? So the first step in a conventional uh, compiler would, would be a parser. What does the parser do? It just takes the source code and produces an intermediate data structure called the uh, abstract syntax tree, the AST. We, we have a sample representation here of the tree. Uh, and this one gets fed into the final uh, um, piece of the uh, decompiler, the code generator, which produces the output. But of course, in an in a, um, industrial compiler, so to say, you'll have many more intermediate phases. However, the part that interests us today is the type checker. So we're going to talk about just about this box today, right? From all this jungle, this is our box today. Okay, um, a little note about type checking uh, and type inference. I think you all know this one, but uh, with type checking, um, all the types are, de are declared, and the type checker all, uh, all it does is uh, it, it validates the consistency of use, definition of use. Whereas with type inference, you can uh, leave out some types, and the, uh, the type inferencer will deduce some of, uh, some of them for you. In the case of, of ML, it can go to extreme cases like leave out all the types, and the compiler will, uh, will infer everything for you in most of the cases. And that's called global type inference as opposed to what Scala has, which is local type inference. Um, yeah, for type inference, uh, there are two main classes of algorithms. We'll see one instance today, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the difference, the difference between them later when you actually know one class of algorithms. Um, okay, so the vehicle language for today, uh, it's uh, microML. We have to define two things, the surface syntax, how it looks like, uh, looks like, and the type system, what are the types supported by the language, right? So we have integers, identifiers, only letters because it's simpler to parse, uh, booleans, true and false, uh, we have single argument anonymous functions introduced by the FN keyword, uh, the parameter and the body of the function is separated by a fat arrow. We have function application which looks like the one in Haskell, so it's separated by a space, you, you don't have parentheses to wrap the argument. Um, also a note, all functions are, are, are single argument in this language, right? So we don't have 
uh, functions with multiple arguments. If you want that, use curring. Next, we have if expressions. So it's an expression, not a, not a statement. It looks very similar to most of the languages. Um, we have uh, simple uh, arithmetic operations, addition and subtract subtraction. We have parentheses to group things. And the final stuff is a way to introduce bindings, which is a let block. Um, it supports single bindings. So in a, in, a, in a let block, you can introduce a single variable. In this case, we have name, which can be used only in the part between in and end. So that's the scope of the, the variable. OK, any questions so far? Good. Uh, this is a small example. We are declaring a variable called ink, and we assign an anonymous function to it, which takes a single param, and we just increment that param. And inside the body of the let expression, we just call ink as a function with the argument 42, right? Result, 43. Okay. Next step, what are the types supported by the language? Uh, we support integers, booleans, functions, and Sorry, uh, and that's all for now. We'll see something later. So we have function type, which is from uh, into bool in this case. So it's just separated by a simple arrow. Okay. Uh, that, that that was uh, at the end where yeah we have a generic so to say. Okay. Um, um, okay. So. Today's algorithm, uh, which is um, after once from 1987, I guess. Um, it's a very simple one. Uh, I chose it because it's very good for, for teaching, actually, because it's, uh, it has a very clear separation of concern, concerns. And it's also scalable for, for other type systems, like, I don't know, something enhanced over ML. And it's composed of three parts. We have them listed above. Uh, the parsing part is outside the algorithm, uh, per se. The three parts are a type annotation phase, a constraint generation phase, and the constraint solving phase. So what do we do in the first step, in the, in the type annotation phase? We'll take a small example. We have here an anonymous function with a, with a parameter called is0. And um, uh, that is0 parameter, we use it as a function inside the, the, the condition branch of an if, uh, if expression, and based on the result of that, we just uh, return it a, a two or three, da, uh, right? Uh, Makes sense, that piece of code? Can anyone guess or actually deduce the type of this expression? What's the type of the, the whole function, the whole anonymous function? Sorry? Right, right. You just group the, the first part because it's a function, right? So it's a function that returns a Boolean given a function that takes an inter returns a Boolean. So I'm using language to avoid grouping in the syntax. <laughs> okay. Um, right, next. So this is the parsing part where we just take the source code and we build a, a tree out of it. And we see that the, for this whole expression we have a fun node representing a function and these blue names on the right are actually names that I'm using inside the Scala code. And the, the actual tree is, uh, is generated using a LaTeX compiler. So I, I draw the diagram to the, using a LaTeX, co LaTeX compiler from the actual abstract syntax, syntax tree. Uh, so this is the node for, for the function. We have one for, for the argument, one for the if expression, and, and so on for each node in, in the tree. Uh, now comes the type annotation part. This is uh, yet another function. It takes an ant type tree and produces a type tree. So what do we do? We just go over each node and, um, sorry. We just go over each node in the tree and uh, invent a new type, a pl placeholder type that will be later on filled with an actual type. The actual type, let me rem remember you, are int, bool, and function types. So these are just play, placeholder types. It's like a template for types, OK? So this is what the type annotation phase does. Uh, and next, uh, oh, uh, just a small mention, this phase will have to keep track of variable declaration and use. So um, uh, when you use a variable, it has the same type as the type of the parameter that introduced it. OK, makes sense so far? 
And that's why you see T1 in two places here. So the upper one is uh, invented, the type, so, uh, so to say, and this, uh, the bottom one is, the, um, is taken from the definition. Okay, next part is the constraint generation phase of the algorithm, um, another function which takes as input uh, this annotated uh, tree and produces a constraint set. So this is an actual set. You can implement it in Scala using a set and constraint can be a, a case class, okay? So what, what does it do? Uh, well, it just goes over um, the nodes of the tree and based on the relationship between them, so uh, when it's at a certain point in the tree it, on a node, it looks around it in the context and um, deduces what, what are the constraints on that node. So for example, here we have an application node. This is the APP node. And it has two children, a var t1 node, called, uh, which is the is zero parameter. And that, uh, that is zero parameter is used as a function, okay? And the argument for that function is one. So what does that mean? That means that t1 must be a function from t5 to t4. That's what on the, uh, that's what on the right uh, hand side. Um, next we have this node, simple node here, which says uh, where we have an integer literal and we just say that t5 is, must be of type int. So we, we just generate um, these constraints for, for, for each node. Um, the type, the type of this node must be a Boolean. Why? Because it's used in the condition uh, node of an if expression. Make sense? Okay. Next we have the uh, then branch of, a, of an if, which is just an integer liter, so it must be an int. Then the else branch, which must be an int as well. Um, and now we have two more conditions uh, that, uh, which basically say that both branches of the if mu must, uh, must produ produce the same type. That's why you have T6 uh, is equivalent to three, uh, T3 and T7 with T3. Okay. Uh, now the function node basically says, okay, this is a function, so it, it must be uh, a function from T1 to T3. Uh, T1 being the uh, type given to the argument of the function and T3 being the uh, type of the function's body. Okay. So. This is the constraint set produced by the, the second phase, the constraint generation, and now we need to solve it. Um, this is solved using an algorithm called unification, uh, and it looks a lot like solving system of, systems of linear uh, equations in algebra. You just have to replace some variables for another, and at the end it will come out something. Uh, so for example, we have uh, right here, um, the first constraint says T1 must be a function from T5 to T4, right? So we just say, hey, T1 is a solution. For this variable in the e equation called T1, we have a solution, and that solution is T5 to T4 as a function. We then, we then, go, um, we then go on the left, and where, wherever we see T1, and I have highlighted it in red, we replace it with the solution the solution found so far. So where we have T1 on the left, we replace it with the, with the result of, with, with the solution to it, right? Okay. And we did the same um, for the next equation, which is T5 might, must be of type int. So on the right, we have a solution, temporary, so, uh, actually this is a final solution because it, it has no variables on the right. So T5 is an int, and then we go to the left, replace T5 with an int. Next, T4, it's a Boolean. We, we consider it a solution, Go to the left, replace it. We have a Boolean where it was a T4 before. Next, T6 is an int as well. Another solution, T7 is, um, sorry, we have to replace it, right? So T6 uh, is replaced here with, a, uh, with an int. T7 is a solution, an int, replace it. Uh, T3 is an int um, uh, because uh, it had an int uh, on the left hand side, replace it. And once, uh, now we have to, uh, int is equivalent to int, which is uh, vacuous, so we don't add anything. We have left just T2. We add that uh, as a solution, and this is our complete solution for the equations we had. And we can just take this solution map and map it to the actual abstract syntax tree, and we see that the type T2 that we invented 
and which corresponds to the uh, to the whole abstract syntax tree. The whole function uh, um, function functional is an int to bool to int, which is what we wanted actually. Okay, so this was basically it. Um, I think I w uh, went really fast on that one. Um, uh, okay, so as I said in the beginning, there are two main classes of algorithms. Um, it's this one that I, I've just shown, which is called constraint-based, um, and there's another one called substitution-based, but all the phases are interleaved, and uh, the famous algorithm W is, a, is an instance of it. Um, I've tried to, to decipher that, but I couldn't, and the constraint-based one is much more approachable. Um, these are all the resources that I've used in case you want to retrace my, retrace my steps. I had a hard time, uh, but maybe this presentation will help in some way. Um, the code is here, and if there's anyone interested in it, I can show it, go through it uh, during the unconference. Um, just a small note, maybe you're wondering uh, why, uh, what Scala uses. Scala does not use this algorithm because um, the constraints that Scala needs to generate are not, are not equations, are in, in equations, and the unification algorithm that is usually worked, uh, used does not work, but it appears there's some recent research co uh, on that, and with an algorithm called beunification, I haven't looked into it, but it seems promising. Um, so the code here, thank you. Questions? Sure. But I, I think even with a structural type system, you still have inequations there? Yes. So inequalities are a problem for structural types. Um, and you can, you can try to restrict it a little bit by formalizing your prototyping, but it's really easy to fall into undividability territory. Like right. No, that, that's why I called it a map, actually. So, um, yeah, it doesn't matter because it's just a map in the end. And as, as, um, as Daniel hinted in the beginning, you might get a map where some of the type variables aren't replaced. So we, you get type, what I call the type placeholder, you get in the solution map, and that's where, where you get polymorphism from. Th those are basically generics. Uh, yeah, so you can get something like this in, in the end. T1 is a T5 to T4, which can be just A to B, which is a polymorphic function. Yep. So uh, this was parsing uh, micro ML, which is you know very very restricted subset. But how far can we push this? Like, how can we get the milli ML or like centi ML? <laughs> like, those, like, what is the stuff where if we add it to this ML language, it would no longer work? Do you have a sense of that? Um, I mean, there are problems even, even with this one. The algorithm does not work for all the programs that you, exp uh, you can express in the, that syntax. So, for example, if you, um, if you want to pass, um, so there's a function that receives uh, another function as an argument, and, let, uh, and let's say it produces a tuple by, by calling that function on two different types. So, and you pass an ID, and you have ID of one and ID of a string inside the body of the function, the algorithm w will break, which is just higher rank polymorphism, which is undecidable, works just for rank two. Okay, any other question? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, so, so I had some, some I, I, I can show it because I finished really fast, actually. <laughs> uh, 
Mm, let's see. So this is project presentation. On that, on the top, you can see. Oh, sorry. I forgot my structure. So I have this, this folder of, of languages which I'm, I'm just exploring. That's why it's called lingua, lingua, lingua. And this is the one, okay, let's see, we have. Can you see it? Okay, so this is the string that I'm parsing. And this, one, this produces a, 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 an AST, which is just a bunch of case classes. Term. Term. So this is the AST. And I just put that AST into a compiler that produces a LaTeX string. I just copy pasted that in, into some GUI, which produced a PDF. And I just copy pasted that furthermore into Keynote. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> I would have just given up and done it by hand. <laughs> yeah, but I want it to be consistent, you know, like yeah. pixel perfect. <laughs> that's, that's cool. Uh, yeah, any other questions? Questions? Yo. Uh, does this how you handle recursion? Does that just happen naturally? Do you need to add it handles recursion, but not what is called polymorphic recursion. So when you, I'm not sure I can, really talk about that one, I just know it. At some point you can, uh, when, you when you have a recursive call, the, it just differs slightly in the type, and at that, at that point the algorithm breaks, breaks, but for factorial or something like that, it works. Um, yeah, so the, the type inference in ML is a pretty sweet spot. It allows you to express a lot of programs, but it breaks really easily at some point. So Haskell has done great, a great job in using uh, type inference for type classes and uh, rank to types and all that kind of stuff, GADTs, and there's a lot of work done there. Anyone else? No. Nope. Um, yeah, another problem with type inference because you, you don't have a debugger for type inference. I mean, maybe it would be nice to have a debugger for the solution map and the constraint set and step through it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's all? Thank you very much.